Welcome once again to the revision class provided by Professor Academy, Chennai. And in today's video, we are going to look at cultural studies. Why this topic? Because earlier culture studies was a part of another unit called literary <coughs> theory. Now, cultural studies is a separate unit and you can expect around three or four questions from this topic. So let's go to today's class cultural studies and introduction. So when we say cultural studies, this is its focus. Cultural critics focus on popular culture, like cinema or like uh, you know, sports, like cricket or anything that, that has reached to the popular or popular imagination to common people. Then you have youth subculture, especially students or especially youth, school, uh, school going or college going youth. Then we have mass culture, how you know, common people buy products or buy things um, for their everyday use. Then we have uh, pulp literature. In the sense, cultural studies doesn't distinguish between high culture and low culture or <clears throat> classical literature and pulp literature. Everything is uh, treated as, as an equal or as equals in culture studies. And culture studies doesn't necessarily focus on literary texts. Literary texts are just a means to study culture or a slice of culture. So literature is not at the center of culture studies. It's only a means that we should understand in the beginning itself. Then journalism, of course, because that reaches out to millions of people every day. Then advertising, comics, romance novels, film, rap music, or music of any nature, or TV serials, on and on. Or uh, under this category, culture studies, we can also talk about food. We can research on food or how it is made, how it, <clears throat> it is um, you know, used by or used at different occasions. Or you can take a particular uh, cultural phenomena or cultural uh, event like uh, sports like Jallikattu in Tamil Nadu, bullfighting or street theater, or you can say column. So take any any cultural form that we do every day or every year. So that can be studied under cultural studies, right? So with this, let's go to this uh, cultural studies as a field of study. In the beginning itself, I have to say that cultural studies as a field of studies, as a field of study emerged in the UK, but it, it necessarily, it, it necessarily is now, it doesn't mean that it started there. It was there everywhere, but as a field of study, it began there. So we can say it's beginning 1964. The Center for Cultural Studies was established in 1964. It was actually a postgraduate research center at the University of Birmingham, the UK. And these are the founders we have Richard Hoggett and Stuart Hall. So whenever there is a question, first they ask a question about its beginning. So if there is an institution, definitely they will ask a question related to the beginning. So 1964 could be a possible question. They might ask, the Center for Cultural Studies was established in the year or at the University of Dash, which university? Or they may ask who, who are the founders, Richard Hoggart and Stuart Hall. Both are very famous, famous critics. So this is the beginning. Then what happened? Let's look at some of the other members of that center. So let's um, abbreviate this Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies. Let's say CCCS, Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies. So these are the major critics or major members of the CCS. Raymond Williams, literary critic, 
E. P. Thompson, historian, Stuart Hall, sociologist. And look at their designation, which itself says that this field demands scholars across disciplines. So because cultural studies is not just, you know, limited to literary studies or, um, you know, historians or sociologists. Anyone can contribute to this field because everything is related to culture. So Raymond Williams, a literary critic, but E.P. Thompson, a historian. Stuart Hall, a sociologist. And the first director was Richard Hoggart. But in 1968, Stuart Hall uh, take over that position. So he succeeded Howard, Hoggart as the director of the CCCS. Then in 1979, Stuart Hall was succeeded by his deputy, Richard Johnson. So when we think of the directors of this Center for Contemporary Culture Studies, think of Richard Hoggart, Stuart Hall, and uh, Richard Johnson, three, three directors. And then this is the name of the journal issued by the center. Working papers in cultural studies. So this could be a possible question. So what is the name of the journal issued by Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies from the University of Birmingham? So our answer is Working Papers in Cultural Studies. So the postgraduate students in that study, you know, studying in that center published research papers on cultural phenomena or cultural events. And those papers were published in this journal. And these papers were later collected as a book or volumes. So here is a famous volume, The Empire Strikes Back, Race and Racism in 70s Britain. It was published by the center uh, containing some of the earlier articles published earlier in the journal. And it was published in 1982, one of the significant collection, collection of essays by this center. Why? Because earlier when we say cultural studies, they focus more on the white culture, the British culture, typical British culture. But when Stuart Hall succeeded as the director of the center, the focus shifted from, yes, of course, British culture, but which also includes race or talks about the blacks and their culture. Why? Because the blacks from around the world, of course, especially from the Caribbeans, moved to Britain and they worked there and they settled there and they became citizens of the UK. So they were also citizens and their culture should also be represented. So that's why the, that's why this shift, the shift from the typical British culture to the subculture or within that we have the black culture. The empire strikes back, okay? Then there are also other collections. We have resistance through rituals. Youth subcultures in post-war Britain. So when we say youth subculture, focus is more on the youth at high school or colleges or universities where they have a culture of their own. And this is studied and essays were written and this was edited by Stuart Hall and Tony Jeffords. And we also have another famous collection called Off Center, O-F-F, Center, subtitle Feminism and Culture Studies, edited by Sarah Franklin, Celia Lurie, and Jack Stacy. And this is also uh, another step in the formation of uh, or in the growth of the center. Why? Now, feminism comes into cultural studies. So, earlier race came into culture studies, now, feminism uh, enters culture studies. So at each and every stage, culture studies accommodated another section or another representation of a particular society, right? So this is how culture studies developed. And when we say the Center for Contemporary Culture Studies, you should remember these years. It was established or founded in 
1964 by Richard Hoggart and Stuart Hall in the University of Birmingham. And as a center, it came to an end in 1988. But in the same year, 1988, it grew into a department of culture studies. So that's the beauty of that year. A center becomes a department. But unfortunately, in 2002, uh, it was closed down. Now it's more like uh, humanities. So it becomes a broader field now. Okay, so you, you have to remember these years, 1964, 1988, and 2002. And with this brief introduction to the center, because this is why this center, of course, there are a lot of other centers across the world concerning cultural studies, but this British cultural studies is considered the foundation or the beginning of cultural studies as a field of study. Now let's go to cultural studies, uh, you know, uh, proper cultural critiques. And we are going to focus on British uh, cultural studies first and the critiques associated with the center, the Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies. First, we have Richard Hoggart. He was a professor of English at Birmingham University in, from 1962. Then in 1964, uh, with uh, Stuart Hall, he founded the center and he was the first director of the CCCS. So this could be the qu uh, possible question. And in 1968, he stepped down from that position and Stuart Hall took over. And after that, Richard Hoggart became the assistant director general at UNESCO from 1969 an eminent person and his contribution. When we say Richard Hoggart, he is associated with this famous book, The Uses of Literacy, Aspects of Working Class Life. And we have to understand when we say cultural studies, it has some leanings towards Marxism. So focus is more on working class culture initially. Of course, they don't differentiate between high class culture or low class culture, no. They study culture in general, but initially, yes, they focus more on working class culture. So we can say culturalism. This is the approach they had. These critics, cultural critics, this is the approach they used. In the sense, the approach is more anthropological uh, and historical. Anthropological in the sense, more study of humanity and history. So when we study a culture, yes, we have to study it historically and anthropologically. So in this book, Richard Hoggart um, studies the English working class culture from the 1930s to the 1950s. So he restricts himself to this decades, 30s to the 50s, and focus working class culture. And the book is divided into two parts, part one, an older order. An older order talks about the lived culture of the working class. So here in detail, he talks about the lived culture of the working class in the sense what they ate or what, what they owed for work or at home. So what they read, which newspaper or which novel or which movie did they watch? So every, each and every aspect of their everyday life. So that everyday life is called the lived culture of the working class. So uh, Richard Hoggart pays close attention to each and every aspect, their hairstyle, their eating habits, their clothing, uh, the wage they earned, their uh, uh, timing, I mean, working timing, so everything is included here. But part two of the book moves from that to another topic, yielding place to the new. Here, uh, Richard Hoggart is bit, uh, you know, bitter in the sense, he gives an acid account of the development of commercial culture. So commercial culture, he sees commercial culture as uh, something that destroys 
the lived culture of the working class how commercial uh, commercial culture uh, almost colonized this lived culture right so that's the second part of this book even now when we think about culture studies this is the first book people go to why because one of the foundation texts of culture studies the uses of literacy which, are, which also talks about their education or the methods now from here we have to go to stuart hall jamaican born british cultural studies and he became the director of the center center for contemporary culture studies in 1968 after richard hogan and he was there as a director till 1979 almost more than a decade and it is during his period his tenure as the director of the ccs culture studies became a well established field of study and before he took over uh, took over the center as the director he worked as an editor for this journal new left review so that was the journal he edited okay what's his biggest contribution to culture studies he talked about the issue of race and racism especially in england how race was not addressed though it was predominant the issue was predominant it's like the elephant in the room but no one talks about race and stuart hall took the initiatives to talk about race and this is one of the uh, topics he they arrived at and focused on mugging m u g g i n g mugging as you know is more like a street crime in the sense if you go alone uh, in a street in a desolated street there could be people uh, low lives considered low life um, they can threaten you at knife point and they can rob you of your money wa wallet watch anything right and this is like a crime but it's not just a crime why this is happening so stuart hall and others they came up with a collection of essays called policing the crisis mugging the state and law and order so he's one of the editors their concern is not just mugging as a street crime but as a social phenomena why this is happening this is not just a separate event this is happening everywhere and why who were the muggers who were those criminals the so called criminals why they were pushed to this extreme and most of the time they were blacks or blacks were portrayed as criminals why so they asked a lot of questions of course why they were forced to do that so they couldn't find jobs their economical need is not satisfied by the government and when they go for this yes this is called a street crime and they were punished but what is the alternative so uh, so this is how culture studies studies a culture a social phenomenon so it could be mugging it could be the working class culture of a particular period so this is how we can also so if you are interested in culture studies you can take any cultural event or a phenomena or a festival and we can observe and do research on that so even if you are students of english literature because under cultural studies we need not focus specifically on literary text we can also focus on uh, any cultural uh, phenomena right so next one raymond williams a critic who is known for this uh, cultural studies when we say cultural studies we immediately think of raymond williams now because of his uh, significant contributions uh, he was a welsh marxist and cultural critic why so if you want to begin reading about culture studies you can start with this essay by raymond williams culture is ordinary published in 1958 very simple and powerful statement he says what is culture our people ask about this question about you know this question they have this question what is culture 
the definition is not simple, but he said, culture is ordinary. Culture is all about how we eat every day or what we eat every day or how we go about our life every day, what we eat, what we wear at home to work or how we spend time with our family, uh, with friends or outside, what we watch at weekends or what we play, everything we do in our life is culture. Culture, not necessarily some kind of a traditional thing. Of course, we follow the tradition by living it every day. So that's what it means by culture is ordinary. And his famous book, Culture and Society, and he restricts himself to studying uh, decades like, uh, you know, centuries like 1780 to 1950. So that's his book, Raymond Williams. And he talks about the word culture in two senses. Number one, when we say culture, it means a whole way of life. What we do every day, common meanings, common things. A simple thing, what you eat for breakfast represents our culture because that's what we do every day. And it differs from place to place. Even if you say India, what we have for breakfast in the South is different. In Tamil Nadu is different, in Kerala is different. Or you go to the North, it's different. Uh, whether it's Delhi or Bengal, wherever you go, it changes. And that represents, you know, the breakfast itself represents that particular culture, what we have for breakfast or lunch or for dinner or for special occasions, or you go for special festivals. Diwali is not the same in India how Diwali is celebrated across India could be a study because Diwali is not same because how it is celebrated differs because what we bear or what we eat for that occasion or how we celebrate with our friends and family differs. So each and everything is a slice of culture. And the second sense of the word culture, the arts and learning. So this is the next way. One is the common thing common thing in the sense that that which we do every day. The second is for special purposes of discovery and creative effort. How our culture is represented in arts and learning, in literature. Not only in literature, also in sculpture, because that's a, when we say our culture, we talk about architecture, we talk about painting, we talk about literature, because these things represent or they are the storehouse of that particular culture. Even we now we say language or literature, everything we claim, okay, our culture is, you know, old, ancient. How do we say that? Because we have records or we have um, evidence, uh, evidence in the form of uh, sculptures or historical sites. So that's how we celebrate our culture. So these are the two senses, one in the common meaning, I mean, the sense of common meaning, another in the process of a special process of discovery and creative effort. Creative effort, which includes a painting and architecture, literature, and other fields. Let's go. Then we go to E.P. Thompson, an English, an English historian. And he was also a member of the center. And uh, he was the editor of the New Reasoner, the journal. So this could be a question because these days we get questions regarding journals. So pay attention to the journals. So we have the New Reasoner by E.P. Thompson. E.P. Thompson is more, uh, you know, in terms of his approach is more going with uh, Richard Hogan. Uh, look at his titles. The Making of the English working class or the poverty of theory and other essays. So E.P. Thompson as a historian, uh, his approach is more historical as also anthropological talking about the working class culture or he calls the culture of the people, of the people. So that's what he's bothered about. So this approach is more uh, to do with uh, Marxism and about how the working class or the lived culture of the working class. And you can get questions like, uh, who wrote this book? Like, 
the making of the English working class, who was the author of this book. So that's how you will get question initially. So by and by, you know, in the next exam or after that, the question will be from, from the book, inside the book. So at this stage, you should be aware of the critics, the major critics in the field and their works and their concepts. That will do for the for these exams now at, at now. From, but later we have to move on. Then another critic, we have Dick Hebditch, H-E-B-D-I-G, British media theorist, his contribution youth subculture. He focused more on youth subculture because the youths of any country or any region, they form or they have a culture of their own. Think of college students. The language they speak differs from the language everybody speaks in, the, in, 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 in a particular society. In terms of their language, in terms of their hairstyle, in terms of their dress, they want to say we are different. We have our own culture. So this is a Heb, uh, Dick Hebditch contribution. Subculture, this is the name of his book. Subculture, the meaning of style. The style refers to here, he says, they display their own codes. The youth, they have their own codes. They want to display it. And immediately we identify, like example, the punks ripped a t-shirt or you have ripped uh, pants now, jeans, or at least demonstrate that codes are there to be used and abused. So youth, yes, they follow the codes established by the society, but they also go against it by modifying that code and coming up with their own codes. So in terms of their hairstyle, each one are coloring or kind of tattooing or kind of a piercing, I mean, uh, ear piercing or kind of any body piercing or uh, language, what language they speak or slang, they have their own slang or group codes or the mode of their transport. So metro, some go by metro, some go by cycle, some by bike. So each and everything, you know, in each and everything, they want to say that we are different. So that's how they, uh, they create their own subculture. Right. So this is uh, Dick Hebditch. Then we have Angela McRobbie, one of the famous cultural critics, was also a former student of the center and also a feminist. Her contribution, she said, okay, when we talk about subculture, earlier uh, Dick Hebditch talked about talked about subculture, but he talked about subculture associated with boys. What about girls? So that's the question raised by Angela McRobbie. So this is her famous book, Feminism and Youth Culture. From Jackie to Just 17. Here the word Jackie and Just 17 refers, uh, refer to journals, uh, magazines. Magazines aimed at girls. And Angela McRobbie says, even among youth, girls they also have a subculture of their own. It's like a room of their own, Virginia Woolf. Similar way, a subculture of their own. So young girls, they, they also have their own hairstyle, the way they dress, the way they use makeups, the way they are, what they listen to. I mean, music, whatever they do, you know, they also have their own culture, subculture, which is a distinctive. Uh, which is distinct, uh, which is which is different from boys' subculture. So that's what uh, she tries to say. And how do we recognize that? Uh, to do this research, Angela McRobbie focused on girls' weekly comics and magazines, and especially from uh, a ma magazine called Jackie to Just 17. Why these magazines focused on girls? And if you look at, or you flip through these magazines, they study their style, hat style, or, um, you know, the way they carry about, or handbags, or their dress, or each and everything. And studying these magazines, you know, gives some insight into that subculture. So that's what uh, Angela McRobbie's topic, okay? 
So with this, uh, let's move on to cultural critics from around the world. So, so far what we have done. So we have looked at the beginning of cultural studies as a field of study, looking at the Center for Contemporary Culture Studies and the major critics there and their contribution to cultural studies. Now let's move to cultural studies from around the world. We are just going to look at the major critics and their concepts and their works. So we have Pierre Bourdieu, B-O-U-R-D-I-E-U, -E Pierre Bourdieu, French sociologist and philosopher. His contribution, he talks about cultural taste. He asks a simple question. We have something called cultural taste. What do you mean by cultural taste? If you belong to a particular culture, if you say Tamil culture or Malayalam culture or Bengali culture, when we say culture, we associate with a particular region. Each region or each part of India, they have their own cultural taste. Taste not necessarily food. So the way, you know, we, we live that life. So how we talk or, you know, how we respond to a cultural event differs or how we respond to anything for that matter. For instance, a movie, a movie which is a success here can be a flop north or which is a success there can be a flop here. Why? Because of people's cultural taste. They have their own set of viewing things, judging things, and how this happens, or how, how this taste is decided, or have that. So we have this Pierre Bourdieu, uh, Bourdieu. He says, this taste is not natural. This cultural taste is not natural. One, if you are born and brought up in a particular culture, yes, you, uh, you imbibe everything in that particular culture, how we eat or when we eat certain food, we enjoy it. When we eat certain food, we don't do that. Why we don't enjoy that? Because we are not used to that. But when we move across cultures, across India, maybe we become tolerant when we, and then we start, we start respecting other cultures and also uh, enjoy other cultures. But initially we have this called cultural taste. Simply put, Pierre Bourdieu says, it is a social construct. This taste is constructed by society. Though it is personal or kind of a collective, it is constructed, it is not natural. So he talks about this in his book, Distinction. Subtitle, A Social Critique of the Judgment of Taste. So this is his topic. So the concept he introduced is the habitus. So this could be a question they might ask in the exam. Who introduced the concept called the habitus? So answer, Pierre Bourdieu. What do you mean by habitus? The word itself says habit, right? What is a habit? Something we do every day, naturally, right? Routinely, that is habit. So remember that. So the concept when you say habitus, something that we internalized, that is a part of our routine. We don't question it. So the habitus refers to internalized social structures or social order, right? From the, I mean, from our childhood, we take it in by and by, by and by, we don't question it. It comes naturally and automatically to us. Even that's how this cultural taste is formed. It's become a formation. So cultural taste is more like a habit formation. So that's the concept by Pierre Bourdieu, right? Remember this. And we can also sense, uh, understand something that if you want, to, if you are interested in cultural studies and if you want to do research on cultural studies, this is how you have to uh, choose your topic, research topic. You have to take something out of uh, the society, maybe cultural taste or subculture, a uh, female, female subculture or male subculture, we have to narrow down or you can focus on a particular food, why this food is served in all the occasions like biryani. So, you know, somehow, you know, you understand this is not simply food or simply cloth, uh, clothing, 
it has it is a part of culture then that that's your topic for culture studies okay next we have two major critics german philosophers and sociologists we have max horkheimer and theodor adorno their contribution dialectic of enlightenment so when we say enlightenment we associate enlightenment the movement with radical thinking when we say enlightened i am enlightened when we say i am enlightened i uh, you think you become kind of an intellectual you are able to think through if someone is give something is given to you 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 think about that so it's more like uh, being a thinker enlightened you are able to think things through so that is enlightenment but these critics max horkheimer and theodor adorno they say enlightenment is mass deception it's not just you are becoming a thinker a uh, individual thinker you are actually being one among the ordinary right you are being fooled but you are one among them is kind of a, a mass deception okay they are focusing on commodity culture so that is their focus so how a particular commodity is forced on us imposed on us but we don't think it is imposed we we think it is just a given we take it for granted so now we have to have a mobile phone a smartphone because it is a given it is it's a necessity now we have to be in a social media or any social uh, network we have to be there or else we are like an alien so we have to do that so this commodity culture it's like conformism so everybody is doing that so i have to do that or you will be alienated so you have to conform to the social rules right you have to be one among them right then their major concept the cultural industry so this could be a question what do you mean by culture studies of course introduced by these two critics max horkheimer and theodor theodor adorno the cultural industry the word industry says as if something is produced automatically mechanically right industry is mass production something is produced for consumption so culture is more like an industry now or simply put education itself is a means of Uh, commodity culture so that's their argument they say see how do we you know why do we spend a lot of money or in newspapers we read or in media or in uh, uh, tv on tv we see that people buy paintings for millions why how do we spend or how do they spend millions on you know art especially paintings or the first edition of a particular novel they spend crores and we can't understand that and why do we and if you want to understand that mark uh, sorry max horkheimer and theodor adorno say uh, simple it is it, it happens you know it is it is formed in our mind it is shaped we are shaped to look at something as art high art and we are told it has some value which has commercial value too so just i don't think an ordinary person will spend millions on a piece of paper or a piece of painting but only the educated spend money on that millions on that or why because their education tells them okay this has value this has more value and this is part of culture you should respect that so we are told okay mona lisa is a part of culture which is beautiful we are told it's beautiful we don't know without that knowledge we may not look at mona lisa as a beautiful painting but we are told often and if we question that we are deemed idiots then we have to follow that so simply put education itself is a means to make us consumers why do we buy for instance mobile phone we if we just go for the temper glass that on the top of that and we spend a lot of on that maybe some for some mobiles we spend 200 or 300 sometimes 1000 why because some 
something is telling us, okay, this is going to protect your cell phone. You have to spend money on that. But its value must be around some 20 rupees or 30 rupees, but yet we buy. So we are made consumers or even culture, everything in, for instance, tourism is an industry. So in that sense, culture is an industry where we expect consumers and we are also consumers. Okay, next one. Walter Benjamin, a German literary critic and philosopher. And his contribution, uh, whenever we think of Walter Benjamin, the first essay or first work we read is, the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction. So this is the essay you should read, in which he talks about the aura of the work of art. I told you before, before this mechanical reproduction age of industrial age, we respected or we, whenever we looked at art, when we, whenever we looked at Taj Mahal or whenever we looked at Mona Lisa painting, you no, know, we were in awe and there is only one which cannot be reproduced. But now with a simple, with our cell phone or with a, a camera, we can capture that and we can reproduce it. I mean, we can take a thousand pictures, we can produce hundred pictures. And the aura around that particular art, whether it is Taj Mahal or any literary work or any a painting, what do you mean by aura? It's a kind of a halo around gods, right? It's like, it is, which is very singular, which cannot be seen anywhere. It's only one, that kind of an aura, godlike aura, A-U-R-A, -A, right? around that work, which is challenged by the mechanical reproduction, because in this age, anything can be produced. So simple, in those days, painting, even now, yes, painting, but painters are respected and they are able to reproduce our, you know, our image, but a simple camera can do now, right? That aura around that field is gone now, right? So that is aura, but the aura simply put the uniqueness, but the uniqueness is gone now in, uh, in the age of mechanical reproduction. So what happens, uh, Walter M. Benjamin says, the technique of reproduction detaches the reproduced object from the domain of tradition. So whenever we looked at the painting, we think it is a part of a tradition. We think about that. But now once we take a picture, that tradition is gone. Even you can be a painter. That's what we assume. When we click, even now, when we go for TikTok or anything, we think we can also be creators. We can also reproduce things. So that's why the uniqueness of art is challenged or it has come down. Now let's go to another famous critic, Laura Mulby, British feminist and film theorist. Her focus is more on films and how Women were uh, women are portrayed in films. So film studies can be brought under culture studies. And she focused on male gaze in cinema. Her famous essay, Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema. She uses a word, uh, the word is already there, scopophilia, S-C-O-P-O-P-H-I-L-I-A. -O -O -I -I what do you mean by scopophilia? Philia means love. Right, philia, philosopher, right? Philosopher means lover of knowledge. Similar way, scopophilia means pleasure in looking. So it is natural for human beings to derive pleasure out of looking at certain things. And Laura Melby uses this term to mean that pleasure of looking at women in screens, you know, in movies, how they are portrayed, and how men derive pleasure out of that glamorous portrayal of women. And that is called male gaze. How male or uh, men objectify women on screens or how they turn into objects, pleasurable objects on screens. So that's the title, Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema. And because of that, what, what we do, we create a kind of binaries male versus female in cinema, where male is more uh, an active 
active participant there. Female is more a passive consumer. Or simply put, male always play an active role. Female is more a receiver, a passive one. Only someone who is there to please male, right? So if you're interested, maybe read this essay where uh, she talks about, she analyzes a particular movies, how women are portrayed there, okay? And with this, uh, let's come to today's, uh, the end of today's class. What we have done in this class, we have introduced or acquaint, uh, we have acquainted ourselves with cultural studies, a beginning where in 1964, how it was established in, in the UK and some of the major critics and their concepts associated with the center, Center for Contemporary Culture Studies and some of the major critics across the world and their contribution and work, okay. And tomorrow we are going to look at MLA Handbook, ninth edition. Same time, seven to eight. So listen to it. And also subscribe to Professor Academy's new channel, Professor Academy English, exclusively meant for students of English literature. And Professor Academy Chennai offer offers courses for UGC NET, SET, UGTRB and PGTRB in Tamil Nadu and Polytechnic TRB and TET. So thank you so much. And if you want to know more details about courses, please contact the number 7550100920. Thank you.